BPOs, uh, they're grabbing how many square meters per building and how usually do the um, um, office uh, developers design or uh, strategize their supply uh, of units around the BPO factor? Yeah, I mean the BPO sector is the main driver. Most developers do uh, design their buildings with BPOs in mind because that's where 98% of the end users are coming from, or something like that. Uh, maybe a little bit on the high side. But and usually uh, how many square, feet, square meters do they get? Um, BPOs typically like a, a, a large sort of open floor plan. So a smaller BPO might take one floor of 1,500 square meters, but the bigger BPOs take up to about 10,000 and even more square meters. So if you're taking that sort of space, um, you, you don't want to be on too many floors. So a floor plate of 1,500 square meters or, or more is ideal. Mm -hmm. mm. And the, the big ones, the big players, uh, Accenture, Converges, Burgess, and all, yeah. they want to be in different buildings for securities, they said. Uh, well, there's that, but it's more to do with their, their client, their client's requirements, where they would like to be. Uh, but also where the labor pool is. I think the, uh, the location of these call centers, these days anyway, is, uh, is driven. Um, of course, real estate prices are important, but frankly, real estate prices in, in the provincial areas aren't a lot different to the CBD in the, in the uh, national capital region. Mm -hmm. uh, it's more a question of uh, an abundant labor supply. So that's why places like Deval, uh, Bacolod, uh, Ilo Ilo um, and, and uh, Cebu, mm -hmm. uh, more recently Deval, uh, these are becoming very popular because of the abundant uh, labor, uh, potential labor pool. Mm -hmm. Labor supply yes. and then the real estate supply. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so the, they two come go together. To, the two go together, that's right. right. But right. it's really the labor is the key issue. I mean, that's at the end of the day, that's why the BPOs are here because of their savings on, on labor costs, mm -hmm. which are probably only 25 or 30 percent what they'd be paying in the US. Mm -hmm. Would you say that because our um, office real estate market is driven by BPOs, um, our, private, our developers here have different strategies in, you know, in, in designing or in um, planning their offices here compared to other countries? You've been to Indonesia. How do, their, how do they design their office buildings? Well, I mean, in, in Indonesia, when I was there, the, the, the BPO sector, the industry, hadn't really got going. And when, in fact, uh, whilst I was away, when I left uh, the Philippines in 2001, um, I hadn't heard of the BPO industry. It was only when I came back in 2005 that, mm -hmm. that this uh, phenomenon had happened. Um, and uh, in Indonesia that wasn't the case. Buildings are very large in Indonesia. They have large, if not uh, as large, if not larger, floor plates. Mm. But the market there is driven by the oil and gas industry. Mm. So you have a lot of big you know, Exxons and Shells and BPs and whatever mm. occupying large amounts of floor space. Mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. here it's more the, uh, the, the BPO sector, the, 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 the large space users. Mm, okay. And, and they, they, do they design uh, their buildings differently? Like here, I notice mo that most of the offices have um, elevators, for example, designed for, you know, the high traffic. Yes. Yeah, well, that's very important, particularly if it's a, a medium to high-rise building and, and all of, or most of your tenants are in the BPO area. The waiting time for the elevator is a can be a serious concern. And so, that's not a concern in Indonesia, for example? Um, well, because those offices didn't employ such uh, <laughs> vast numbers of people, mm -hmm. the space, the square meters per person was a lot more. So, uh, whereas here it's sort of six square meters per mm -hmm. person. Mm -hmm. So you're getting a lot of people into these, uh, into these offices. And if you have contiguous floors occupied by BPOs, then you're quite a build up of traffic. We have some questions from social media. Oh. Uh, we have one from at ILO. Where is the best place to invest in the Philippines, the upcoming areas, and would it be better to invest in uh, commercial or residential units? Well, it's, uh, it's easier to, to invest in, in residential. Uh, as far as upcoming areas are concerned, uh, the, the capital region, of course, is expensive, uh, relatively expensive. 
Uh, but I think you've got to look at where the infrastructure is going. And there's a lot of new uh, roads planned going down to Cavite uh, and up to Bulacan in the north. So uh, I think the sensible thing to do, if you don't want to pay too much, is to, is to look at those areas that will surely emerge over the next uh, three to five years mm -hmm. as the LRT lines expand and, and the, uh, the roads, the expressways grow. So they're the areas that you should look so at. So we should tell Aya to look out for those announcements by the government yes. as to where the rail lines, look, roads, Look where the LRT airports. ones go, exactly. The new, the new airport, we don't know where. That may be in Clark, but uh, there's talk of another airport somewhere nearby. Mm, okay, another question from the same. Ayalo, we're seeing a lot of high-end property coming up, like Trump Tower, Azure Residences. Is there enough demand? Well, uh, apparently yes, because Trump Tower is 80% uh, sold. Mm -hmm. uh, it was only launched just over a year ago, uh, and it's comparatively expensive. I mean, it's about 180,000 pesos per square meter. Yes. So it's beyond the reach of, uh, of most ordinary mortals. Uh, but they are 80% committed. So, Who are the buyers of Well, uh, I think, I guess, a lot would be uh, uh, professional overseas workers but uh, well-to-do families here in the Philippines who already have their house in Forbes or Das Marinas village uh, and are looking perhaps to buy condo units for the children. Um, I think the Trump Tower has captured the imagination. It's been well marketed and uh, yeah. And the branding does help? The branding certainly helps, yes. Oh, As uh, Century Properties would vouch for that. Yeah, but as you mentioned, they, are only, they only account for like 3% of the market. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Another question from Cool Kideko. Can new business districts like Quezon City compete with Makati and Orticas? Because uh, Ayala Land has just said that they, are, they have a new central business, business district coming up in Quezon City. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, traditionally there was... 60 billion, if I remember yeah, right. Yeah, in the, the, the food terminal they're, they're developing down in the south. But yes, I mean, traditionally there was Makati, then there was Ortigas, and more recently Fort Bonifacio. So you've got the three main CBDs. But as space gets limited and prices go up a little bit, um, end users need to look to other areas. So you've now got about 19 emerging business districts within the NCR. Uh, mm. Quezon City, uh, you know, Mandaluyong, we know, the Bay uh, City area. Mandaluyong? Mm. There, there, there will be more in Mandaluyong? Yes, more in Mandaluyong. Okay, yes, and then the Taguig, as you mentioned. And Taguig, yes. That's the 24 and then, uh, billion. You've got the, uh, the Bonifacio Global City, you've got McKinley Hill, and as you go further south, you've got the new FTI development, 74 right. hectares, which Ayala are going to do. But we've been talking about um, Fort Bonifacio for the past decade. Mm -hmm. uh, so how soon do we start talking about a booming Quezon City Central Business District? Oh, it, or it, it's happening already. I mean, there's already lots of uh, development plans within, uh, within Quezon City, uh, both along EDSA and along the C5. Uh, lots of developments planned. So I think you'll see over the next five years well, quite a lot happening in Quezon City. Well, the government did. Um, uh, men well, they mentioned that the uh, earnings of uh, these big developers have jumped twofold over the couple of uh, mm. months, which actually goes back to our discussion on the uh, impact or the contribution of the real estate industry to our uh, to our Filip to the Philippine economy. economy yes. um, do you have any last words? We're reaching the last few minutes of our show. No, I, I think um, I'm generally upbeat about uh, what's happening and. Uh, uh, we predict the BPO industry will certainly grow. Um, I, as I said earlier, I think the residential sector, uh, certainly in the, in the medium term, is, is looking very promising. Uh, another interesting factor, though, we're also getting interest. The Philippines is getting interest from non-BPO users. Uh, in, in 1995 to 97, we were leasing offices to uh, banks, financial institutions, smaller floor areas, but they, they made up the... Uh, the entire user demand. We are now seeing those banks and financial institutions coming back into the fray. Really? So uh, okay. it's not just BPOs. We're getting an, adi an additional maybe 50 to 70,000 square meter per annum demand from the, the traditional office sector. Well, they do say that real estate is a vote of confidence yeah. or doubt on the Philippine economy. Yes. So now